Welcome to Trail Talk here on LTTV. I'm Chris Ford, the Director of Marketing for Lincoln Trail College and Illinois Eastern Co Community Colleges. And I'm joined to my right by Dr. Zahi Atala, the President at Lincoln Trail College. Zahi, how are you today? I'm doing great. I'm doing excellent. And I think our viewers are going to be excited about what I'm excited about, which is talking about student success. That's right. We're, we're launching a, a new series mm -hmm. here on LTTV where we're talking about student success. And uh, to start off with, we have Teresa Craig from Lone Star Community College in Texas. Yes. Uh, I've had the opportunity of overlapping with Teresa when she was at the Wisconsin Technical College System. And prior to that, she worked for a number of years at the same college I worked at in Wisconsin. And, and I think uh, her perspective from her own experiences as well as her professional uh, experiences is critical to understanding um, what students need and how we can serve them better and how we can really wrap our services around them based on their needs. All right, well, let's uh, take a listen to what Teresa Craig has to say about student success. All right, now joining us on Trail Talk is Teresa Craig. Teresa, how are you doing today? Fabulous for Monday. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So uh, for our audience that doesn't know you, uh, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself to us, tell us a little bit about your, your background and, and who you are. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Teresa, as you shared. Um, I come to you with 23 years of two-year community and technical college experience. In my current role, I serve as vice president of student success down at Lone Star College in uh, the suburbs of Houston, Texas. Uh, I'm located at our Tomball campus. Prior to my time here in Texas, my other uh, 20 plus years were in the Midwest, both in Illinois and Wisconsin colleges, and also at the Wisconsin State Office, at the Wisconsin Technical College State Office. So I've done every facet of um, student services. Uh, my first role early on, starting in enrollment um, and moving my way through advising, um, assessment and tutoring services, I've overseen disability resources and uh, career development for our students. So any gamut of student services, um, I've probably touched it or at least had responsibility and dotted lines of, of um, accountability for those areas. So um, really excited to be with you all today and really just to brainstorm um, what we're doing to serve our students and how we can do it better. Teresa, uh you worked at Black Hawk Technical College, a place that I also worked at, and, and you you dealt with a combo of urban and, and uh, rural areas with diverse uh, populations, uh, but you also worked in, in suburban uh, Chicago, yes. at Harper, and, and now in suburban, uh, or not quite suburban, but, but in the yes. metro uh, area of Houston. What have you seen and what do you currently see as um, recurring themes, if that's even a descriptor, of student concerns that are affecting uh, their persistence and their success? And are you, have you seen shifts over time as well, or are those uniform? Sure. Definitely have seen shifts. Um, and I appreciate that question because I think there are um, especially in this moment in higher education and especially at our two-year colleges, um, a tremendous need and opportunity for us to really look at our students holistically and really um, look at what the last three years to five years have looked like for students and their families. Um, I think it's really important. I. I don't know about your college, but at our college, you know, we have a lot of of our own struggles with sort of what were we working on pre-COVID, and now that we're back to running a campus, and what does what do our services and and what do we do post-COVID? And it's not business as usual by any means, and I think that 
allowing our our staff and our faculty and our students to really just own that moment of reality that we can't just pick up where we left off at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, here at 2022, going into 2023, like, okay, here were those strategic plans, and now let's go make them work. Our students post-COVID or, or learning to live with COVID, however we want to talk about that, um, they've got some of the same challenges that they had, but even more so. And I'm going to name those, and then we can dig into those however you prefer. Um, I think about their mental health. I have young adults myself, what they thought they were going to do, how they ended up graduating, experiencing or not experiencing certain rules of passage, prom and things. Um, it has affected their mental health. You know, there have been some extreme disappointments in regards to, you know, what they thought life was going to look like, for example. Um when we look at our economics right now and how our families are challenged financially, looking at the cost of groceries and gas, um, transportation, the need to work versus the need to go to college, right? There's the cyclical, the chicken or the egg here um, because they have a need to make money. And um, we know that education will increase those earnings. But right now, that need to make money is, is you know, impacting some of their decisions to pause and not um, start school right now. And we're seeing that across our nation with our enrollment trends. Um, so that need to work is becoming the focus. And so our opportunities at our colleges, I know one of the things we're looking at, and I've always been a big proponent, is looking at our work study through a different lens. What are we paying for wages? How do we expand those opportunities and increase those wages where students are getting, um, again, more experience that they can then translate sort of that learn and earn. What's their degree? What are our positions? What are we paying? And how do they take those experiences beyond our college doors? Um, food and housing and security. So, you know, again, I've opened at um, a couple of our colleges now. I, I did not at this college, but we are rebranding our pantry to a grab and go. I don't know about your kids, but my kids and, and many of our students, regardless of age, they're moving in um, from one area to another. They're dropping kids off and coming to class. They're waking up and coming to class or leaving work and coming to class. And being able to grab food along the way is challenging. So when we think about food insecurity, it's not always about the resources and monies. It's about time. And so we've got things that students can grab, pop in the microwave, whether that's a Pop-Tart, whether that's a cup of noodles, um, really taking away that stigma of food pantry to just making sure that when students are on our campus, they're not hungry and whatever that looks like. So we have snacks in our assessment center, you know, granola bars and fresh fruit. So again, regardless of where students are, if they're hungry and we need to feed them, we can do that. In terms of remediation and ways that we've traditionally offered courses, I think time to completion is a challenge. So we're seeing across, again, um, not just our college, but the nation, um, more opportunities for 12 or eight week courses, sort of mini semesters, and ways that we can get students through um, using multiple measures. So not just relying on one point in time standardized test to sort of decide whether a student is ready or not ready for a course. So um, yeah, I think that is, I uh, got on a tangent there, but a number of different ways that I see our students are challenged and um, it is impacting their persistence and success, but some of the things that I hope we can dig into a little bit today. I, I said I won't ask uh, follow-up questions, but I, I do because, because you got me all excited. Are you seeing um, any, are, are you seeing the same underserved populations being consistently both in, well, not just both, but gender, race, and ethnicity, and, and, and uh, socioeconomic, and what have you, being the same folks who are suffering today as suffered in years past? Are you seeing a shift? What, what, if you had a magic uh, ball, sure. are you... Well, what's your thought? 
So again, I know that, and I don't have any ready statistics for you, but I think that most folks, if you dig into your data at your college, um, most folks would tell you on a national scale and you can Google or read anything regarding like post COVID impacts, you know, on, on higher education, we're seeing those traditional achievement gaps, um, either staying stagnant or the same or erasing any of the work that we've done pre COVID. And then we're also seeing, um, those exacerbated. So those have widened, right. Um, we also see that, um, and again, for our college, we have, um, a greater, gap that's growing for not just recruiting our male students, our younger male students, especially across any demographic, but then obviously if we're getting them, retaining them um, or having them persist um, with, you know, the GPAs we need to see not ending up with satisfactory academic progress concerns. So um, again, I started off talking about that mental health piece because I do think that was, um, you know, three to five years ago, an increased concern across our colleges, across the nation. And I think we're seeing that um, even more so, you know, even our high achieving students needing a chance to touch base with, you know, licensed counseling folks. And so that's something that um, our college system here, we um, contract those services out but we do have them available and they're available virtually as well as in person at all of our campuses and centers, because we do see, again, regardless of age, demographic, um, gender, there are just folks juggling so much, whether that's for themselves or others, and they need a safe, um, healthy place to just relax, brainstorm, have support, um, all of those things. So, Teresa, you've covered some of this, uh, you know, as we've talked this morning already uh, about some of the, the best practices that you're seeing uh, to effectively remedy some of the things that, that we've talked about already today. Yeah. So, I mean, if I were to expound on that a little bit, um, you know, again, I'll, I'll go into that mental health piece. I think whatever, you know, you're able to do in regards to, um, you know, if you have funds or can identify uh, grant funds that would support um, or uh, allocate funds in your budget to support um, some type of service and access for students. If you don't already have that, I don't want to assume you don't, but if you don't already have that, and especially um, a service that allows for some virtual connection and, and normalizing that um, opportunity for students to just check in and get some help. Um, one of the things that we do around finals time is bringing our resources out of our typical tutoring spaces into our more general mainstream student spaces and commons areas. And that includes, um, you know, stress, stress relief time that might be mini massages, could be therapy dogs, um, Again, feeding the students and then having tutors ready right then and there to help them with final papers or to help them um, work on those uh, math equations that are probably going to be on the test. So again, sometimes when students aren't making their way to our services, how do we bring services and usually food <laughs> down to them? And then they'll usually engage with us and, oh yeah, that's right, I, I do need that that paper read. Um, I think when we think about the increased cost of textbooks, when we can adopt open education resources, when our faculty can, you know, weigh in on those decisions or um, share their good resources across or really strategize together on book adoptions or a time frame in which they won't switch books so that students can, if they're renting or buying books, be able to return those and get some of those monies recouped or sharing them with others. Or if our uh, different programs and resources are able to do uh, book loans, that we're not doing that every semester. We have a period of time where we know those books are going to be good because that book isn't gonna change so repetitively. Um, 
And then I think again, um, transportation. So our particular college at this time is not on a bus line. When I was at Black Hawk and Zahi, you can weigh in on this. We had a campus that was not on a bus line about 50 miles away. And so um, depending on what our students' needs are, you know, they may have vehicles, but how many folks in the family are needing access to that? Here at our campus, um, our students are coming to see us more readily right now, our new students, um, at about 4 to 5 p.m. because parents are able to either leave work early or what have you and then get them here. And so um, we're seeing that that's a time that we're getting the traffic that we're wanting to get. So what I've done with my team here is said, hey, I know it's summer. I know we said we're only going to be here till 6. However, if this is the time folks need us, we're going to adjust those expectations a bit on this once a week, and we're going to serve them at these times. The other thing that we're doing here is um, we're always looking at our applied, not enrolled lists. And if we have students that are coming for testing, new student orientation, um, a, a visit to see an advisor to get courses, we're trying to see what else can we get done with them because we're gonna have them as a captive audience here that day. And we're trying to get where that time frame is capitalized and they don't have to make repeat visits because gas is expensive. Right. And we know that, you know, the the less time we have to get them here and to actually really get those things off their checklist, we're really working on that so that we can um just really get them to the finish line and yep, you're done, you're ready. And and so that's uh, some of the things that we're doing in, in terms of, of looking at the challenges of, of gas prices and transportation. It's interesting because uh, the where Lincoln Trail now is, is in some ways similar to Blackhawk in the sense that we're surrounded by farmland, but the difference in, in uh, uh, Janesville was that, well, we're far from Janesville, far from Beloit, and needless to say, super far from, from Monroe, uh, with, uh, as you know, a winter that makes it really hard to skate your way, ride your way, or walk your way to the college. So I absolutely appreciate all the efforts you put in to make that bus line happen. Um, along the lines of what you're talking about, um, what are you hearing about seeing or yourself implementing that uh, in terms of future trends, right? Uh, much of what we talked about thus far is remedying the current situation, which has been around for decades. And But is there anything that you're thinking about or hearing about in terms of support and wraparound services that we maybe want to plan for? Absolutely. Um, so we're really big, and you and I have worked together before um, here at Lone Star and at our campus in specifics around really breaking down those silos between our services and our instructional partners. So I meet with my counterpart, um, Vice President of Instruction, pretty regularly, and we're always looking at, you know, what are those course norms? Like wh what's filling, what's not? What's our face-to-face -face looking like? What's online enrollment looking like? And then including our director of advising with those deans um, and some of my other leadership so that we're really partnering and creating when we talk about wraparound experiences and holistic experiences. We're understanding prior to day one of a semester, where are most of our students in terms of their you know, enrollment patterns. Are they on campus? Are they online? When we talk about creating environments that really speak to them and engage them, um, one of the greatest um, attended um, activities that we had from student engagement last fall, just coming back to a live campus, was an online spoken word event where students, faculty, and staff and we kind of prioritize students, then faculty and staff to be able to um, just engage with one another with their, you know, poetry and, and to be able to get out, you know, some of the feelings around um, what what folks are going through. And so that poetry really reflected um, 
And that was a really great online event that was attended. And I think it surprised folks. We had over 70 folks on that call, um, on that Zoom. And um, and we started to see and do more of that because we had um, some of our veteran students that were off campus heading to work on the call reciting their poetry. If that doesn't engage a student and connect them back to our campus and for us to understand we can serve them, we just have to be a lot more creative and we want them on campus, but what we want and what their reality is, I think sometimes gets lost. And so I think anytime we can bring student voices into that experience as well, that's going to be critical in terms of meeting their needs. One of the things our data showed us um, was our eight-week courses have been having increased success, but the timing of certain courses um, was potentially posing a challenge. And for example, um, our first eight week course for um, what we would consider a first year experience or um, first year seminar course, and it is a state requirement here, had really good success rates. Our second eight week course for that same course did not. Mm. Well, what we found was if you're a student who's taking traditional 16 week courses and that course gets added as a second eight week course by those second eight weeks if you're persisting and doing well that course has a lot less meaning to you than if you had taken it the first eight weeks so one of the things that we've talked about in looking at that data with our our in, instructional counterparts was actually holding back or ghosting those second eight week courses like that until we're enrolling students who actually didn't start the first eight week at the traditional start of the semester so that they only saw the 16 week course or the first eight week course. And then we're hopefully only using that second eight week course for new, truly new students starting mid midmester. And now that's one of their first courses for, for example. Those same uh, late starting students that have routinely been uh, ill-served by a 16-week semester that they start later or or, or they apply to rather, or enroll in rather late. Yeah, I, I see what you're trying to do there. Yes, and by removing that first or that second eight-week course from traditional 16-week students, we're increasing the likelihood that they're not going to sabotage themselves taking a course right. along the way that they're like, why am I doing this? So we're trying to get them to take it in that first eight weeks or that full 16 weeks, um, for example. So it's just looking at our data and, and seeing what's happening there. And again, I think sometimes in our colleges, we're moving so fast, we have to have time and intentionality to pause and say, what's working? What's not working? Okay, these courses aren't filling, but these are already at capacity. And really being able to be nimble and shift. And I know that that is um, challenging for our deans and folks who are our schedule builders. I know it's challenging for faculty to sometimes get out of their comfort zones and teach at times or in ways that might be really different than what they've ever had to do. But if that's what our students need from us, these are the ways that we're going to be able to effectively serve them and get out of our enrollment humps. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, Teresa, we've unpacked a lot today. Is there anything else that that we haven't talked about today that, that you would like to share with us? Um, boy, clearly I'm passionate about this and I... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Really appreciate the opportunity to just talk with you all. You know, again, I think our colleges are our best opportunity for our communities to grow. Um, I think, you know, as we try to continue to stay nimble and on the cutting edge of not just growing um, for our, our economy's sake, but also for our employers and making sure that 
we are giving our students, regardless if we're in Illinois or in the suburbs of Houston, um, the best opportunity for success. And that includes, um, you know, global lenses around um, what the world of work is going to look like, whether that's, you know, some remote, some in person, and what those um, behaviors and patterns look like, whether that's really exposing um, on our campuses where we have gaps. So if it's transportation, for example, we have that now. For you all, I don't know um, if you have a bus line, but if you don't, what are your resources to address what students need? Um, to be able to get access to the campus, to food, to um, whatever other services that they might need when they're not in class. Um, and again, looking at our budgets and our data and making sure that it's not business as usual because the world is not what it was three to five years ago. It's continuing to evolve. And we, in order to stay competitive and relevant to our communities, we have to evolve with it. All right, well, Teresa, I'd like to uh, thank you for joining us on Trail Talk today. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, well, there you heard from Teresa Craig from Lone Star Community College uh, on Trail Talk. And a couple of things that I think were really worth pointing out in there as far as student success goes. One is mental health, and two is looking at how long terms are within a semester? Yeah, uh, mental health has been brought up over the last couple of years as a major challenge, and uh, few of us colleges have really taken it seriously and taken the next step. Uh, many have had, you know, a psychologist uh, on campus, uh, campus, whether it's an employee or contracted for a long time, but really making a concerted effort to offer uh, services that really fit student, faculty, and staff schedules has not been the number one priority for us, uh, you know, especially in a rural area. You and I have talked a lot about the availability of such services. Um, what did it spur in you when you heard Teresa mentioning it? Yeah, I mean, you know, access, as you mentioned, it's huge. And you're looking at a generation right now of college students that are putting a focus on mental health. Right. Uh, in a way that I don't think we've, we've seen before in higher education. And it's something that is tremendously important. And in a rural area, you are in a desert generally yeah. of mental health services that are available. So it is important for uh, colleges to have some sort of access built in. Yeah, um, you know, the, the idea of having walk-in sessions, the idea of having uh, particular activities to help the students, especially in light of the trauma that the uh, uh, pandemic has created um, on a society basis, not just on an individual basis. Um, those are things to keep on our radar. The other thing that I thought was very interesting was talking about the lengths of terms. Yes. Uh, you know, most people, when they're thinking about a college class, they're thinking about that traditional 16-week cycles where you are taking a class over the course of an entire semester. Uh, and, and she talked about uh, variations of that, that that provide different levels and a higher success. Yes. I mean, uh, you and I have talked on a number of occasions about the variety of, of colleges and, and what they do. Historically, there have been colleges, I think Cornell, uh, Cornell College in, in Iowa is one of them, that have gone on four-week cycles. Uh, why is that a good thing? Well, because life happens over 16 weeks more so than over four weeks, so the student can focus on that particular class and, uh, you know, the other uh, important things in life are unlikely to come in and impede their way, whereas in 16 weeks, that's uh, more problematic. Lots and lots of uh, colleges have espoused eight-week uh, mini-masters, but then we need to ask ourselves, why do we have a fall and a spring term and, and a teeny tiny summer term? Why isn't education a year-round 
uh, opportunity for our students, kind of like businesses. Uh, I'm not sure what you think about it, but I think it's definitely worth exploring. Uh, you know, one of the things I thought about a lot hearing that is when we think about college, we're, we're very much thinking about that traditional, you know, 18-year-old just out of high yeah. school. Yeah. Uh, but for someone that is in the workforce and is coming back to college later in life for whatever reason, the opportunity to jump in at different points uh, and have those shorter terms, mm -hmm. I think there's a tremendous advantage uh, for, for someone in that so-called non-traditional student group. Yeah, yeah. And uh, private for profit uh, colleges have really perfected that skill. Sometimes they start the class every two weeks and it goes on uh, year round. So yeah, let's, I mean, you and I need to think more about it, need to look at what the best practices are and, and see what the, where we can take it. Well, if you like uh, topics like this, we'll keep talking more on Trail Talk right now on our little mini series on student success. Uh, if you like this video, be sure and hit the like button down below. Ring the bell so you get notifications when we post new content on our YouTube channel. And certainly follow us on our other social media platforms as well. So for Dr. Zahi Atala, I'm Chris Ford. We'll see you next time on Trail Talk on LTTV. Thank you.